Welcome everyone. The next series of lectures are going to take a look at release and reentry. So how offenders are released from prison and then the process of reentering society. We'll start with this short lecture and in the, within this lecture we're going to take a look at some of the historical methods used in the United States as well as briefly going over the five current methods of release in the United States and then we'll wrap up with a little discussion about how offenders are prepared for release from prison. The readings that correspond to this particular lecture are chapter 15 from your course textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. For our historical recap about the methods of release from prison, we're going to focus primarily on the period from roughly 1920 to the mid-1970s within the United States. And this era was really important because this was sort of the height of sort of the rehabilitation approach within our correctional system. And during this time period, all states in the U.S., as well as the federal government, used what is known as indeterminate sentencing. So this meant that at the time that an individual was convicted of a particular felony offense and then sentenced to prison by a court, they were given an indeterminate sentence. And that usually had a minimum period of time that they had to serve as well as a maximum. So it may be five to 10 years, um, 10 years to life, uh, two to five years, whatever it was, it usually had this sort of like two ends to this range of time within this indeterminate sentencing. Now, once the person had sort of served enough time to meet sort of their minimum amount of time in prison, they would go before um, a parole board. And the parole board would review that particular individual's case to see whether or not they were eligible and ready for release back into society. And at the point at which the parole board decided if somebody was eligible for release, this was known as discretionary release, where the discretion came from the parole board. Once the parole board determined that somebody was ready for release, they were released onto what we typically call parole, which is supervised um, super, or post-release supervision for these offenders after release from prison. In order to make sure we understand the concept of indeterminate sentences as well as discretionary release from prison, let's take a, a brief look at an example. So let's imagine that an individual has been convicted of a felony and sentenced to a period of 6 to 12 years in prison. So that 6 to 12 years is that indeterminate sentence. How do we then get to this notion of discretionary release? Well, once a person has met the minimum of that indeterminate sentence, so six years, but it's not always just six years, there's a little bit more going on to it. So it's usually hitting that minimum period of time, in this case, six years, but then we can subtract even more time. So maybe the offender can potentially get credit for jail time, time that they spent in jail prior to their trial and prior to their conviction. That is taken away from the six years. Um, they can also earn good time while they're in prison. Now this varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and state to state, but two of the most common sort of, you know, good time um, mathematical formulas are what we typically call one for three or one for four. Um, and that just means that, let's use one for four as an example. It says that for every four days that you are quote unquote good in prison, that you don't have any rule infractions, you don't get in trouble etc you have one day knocked off your overall sentence so over time if you're a good inmate you can have quite a few days or even months or years knocked off of your sentence so they take the jail time that was previously served remove that the good time that they have earned remove that from their sentence and then also there's another area called meritorious good time and this once again varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction but meritorious good time might be something where if an inmate has during their time in prison earned their GED or picked up or accomplished some sort of certification program about job skills or vocational skill building or something along those lines, they can earn sort of like a clump of days that they can take off from their overall prison sentence. So maybe it's 10 days, maybe it's 30 days, maybe it's two months. What, and once again, like I said, that sort of varies from place to place and time period to time period. So let's imagine we have our inmate, we think about six years, we think is the minimum amount of time, but we have to subtract the amount of time they spent in jail, 
the good time that they've earned as well as any meritorious credits that they've earned and subtract that once they have met their new minimum which may now be only somewhere between four to five years of time once we've subtracted all those sort of credits they go before the parole board and the parole board will review their case and it's up to the parole board to look at the the offender what they've done while they were incarcerated um, obviously looking at what were the facts of their case were there aggravating or mitigating circumstances what is the criminal history of this particular offender are there any um, obvious risks to releasing them back into society or other special circumstances that they need to take into play into consideration and then that parole board will make a decision um, they can decide that the person is now eligible to be released into society or they can say nope you're not quite ready and then they can send them back to prison for a specified period of time uh, whether it's a year whether it's several years whether it's six months once again depending upon the jurisdiction and then the offender would return back to prison and they would return to the parole board at this time that would be set in the future so once an individual has pleased the parole board and has um, shown that that individual is eligible for release, the parole board will determine that they're ready to be released and they will be released on to supervised parole. And supervised parole is where they will leave the confines of the prison, but they're still under what we call correctional supervision. So they will return back into society. Uh, maybe they'll go back to where they were living, find a new place to live. Maybe they'll um, move to a halfway house or some other sort of treatment facility within the community. But the key thing is once they're back into the community, they are now on parole. So this parole uh, period can also last different lengths of time. It can be, you know, the parole board can determine that they should be supervised for one year in the community, two years, three years, etc. Historically in California, at least up until AB 109 and the realignment approach in California that took place about um, 10, 10 to 15 years ago, the sort of standard in California throughout the 1980s, 1990s, and the um, early 2000s was sort of a three-year parole term after somebody had been released from prison. So although all of the states in the U.S. as well as the federal government sort of relied upon that indeterminate sentencing and then discretionary release from roughly 1920 until about 1973. We then saw in the mid-1970s sort of the what I say is the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back was the report released in 1974 by Robert Martinson. Now this is a study that I've mentioned in previous lectures but just to give you a quick recap about it. Robert Martinson published this, repeat, this piece in 1974 and the takeaway message of it was that our attempts at rehabilitation within our correctional system, particularly, particularly our prisons, didn't work. Um, it was, his argument was that our attempts for having treatment and therapy in order to rehabilitate individuals were ineffective and therefore this whole rehabilitative ideal took a lot of flack for that. And then we combine that with two things around that same time in the early to mid 1970s. So you have this report coming out from Robert Martinson that sort of, you know, shoots down the, the effectiveness of rehabilitation in general. We have the civil rights movement going on. We have the prisoners rights movement going on where we're starting to see much more of like opening that black box of the prison system and starting to see what's really going on. And politically we're seeing sort of things that are upsetting both sides of the political spectrum as far as the approach to how we were handling our prisons and how we were handling the sentencing um, of our of our inmates so what was that well the two things that i note here are one is that this argument that parole board decisions were starting to be seen as arbitrary and often discriminatory as far as who was 
who was released and who was not released. Um, parole board decisions oftentimes would take place behind closed doors. They were not open to the public. Um, the facts of their decisions were not always made available to the media or to the public in general. And so there's a lot of question about sort of the efficacy and sort of the um, honesty and how they were making decisions and deciding who should be released as well as who should remain in prison for a longer period of time. So this was impacting and upsetting one you know segment of the society and when we think sort of think about um, the political spectrum we really are sort of the the classic way of conceptualizing this was saying that this was upsetting sort of you know the left side of the political spectrum or the or the liberal leaning individuals who did not like this sort of closed door uh, meetings where it could be very arbitrary and discriminatory outcomes. On the other side of the political spectrum, especially with the release of the Robert Martinson report in 1974, we saw that individuals that we would typically label as being more on the right side of the political spectrum or the conservative end of the political spectrum found that this rehabilitative approach within our, our prisons was seen as coddling the offenders or giving them more services than what they really needed. Um, once they sort of looked in and people would look at, you know, what kind of rehabilitation and treatment programs and realize that offenders were getting access to education, access to vocational training, things of that nature, there was a little bit of an uproar about why should taxpayers be paying for somebody who is a convicted felon to receive anything that a free citizen has to pay for. Um, so it was sort of a perfect storm in the mid-1970s where we started to see that both sides of the political spectrum were not happy with this approach, called, with this indeterminate sentencing and discretionary release approach. And therefore, we saw that those start to crumble. State by state started to change their sentencing practices. Um, California, it was right around 1976 is when we changed and, and moved away from indeterminate sentencing to rather what is now referred to as determinate sentencing, where there was not this sort of, you know, open range of, of time period for a sentence um, and a lot of like uncertainty about how much time somebody would serve. And so state by state in the mid 1970s and into the 1980s, we started to see states rewrite their statutes and their policies in order to bring in what we now call determinant sentencing policies, where the idea was that the public, the family, the victims, everyone would have a better idea of how much time somebody would serve after they had been convicted of a felony crime. And sure enough, between the mid 70s through the 80s through the 90s as i mentioned we started to see state after state changing their policies as far as how they would go about sentencing and by 2002 16 states and the federal government had completely abolished discretionary release by parole boards and of those that kept parole boards, they were often reluctant to release prisoners. Um, and you started to see a lot of states that even though they had parole boards who were there for a discretionary release mechanism, they would it, only in you know few and far situations actually choose to release prisoners before their maximum term. After the shift away from indeterminate sentencing and discretionary release, states had to figure out how they wanted to run their correctional systems. And therefore, they had, a, you know, had to think of different mechanisms and different ways to go about both sentencing individuals to prison as well as deciding how they would be released. Um, and currently, there are five basic release mechanisms used across the United States. We're going to focus primarily on the three that are covered on this particular slide. Um, they are the most commonly used. And then on the next slide, I'll briefly talk about the other two. Um, but let's take a look at each one of these and make sure we sort of understand the you know, similarities and differences across each one. So what we see here first is discretionary release. So this is what we talked about with the previous example. So individuals who would be sentenced 
um, under an indeterminate sentencing statute would be given a, a wide range of time with a minimum and maximum to their sentence. Um, at some point in time, usually once they met their minimum period of incarceration, they would go before a parole board and the parole board would make uh, this, the decision about whether or not that individual was eligible for release. If they were, they would be released under this discretionary approach and then they would be released onto parole. And that's what we saw on the previous slides. Now let's move down to number two. Number two, mandatory release. So mandatory release goes hand in hand with this overall sentencing shift that took place in the late 70s and, and 1980s across many states. So many states, including California, shifted to what are known as determinant sentencing statutes. And this was the result of a push mainly by the public who wanted more transparency within the correctional system. They want, we talk about things like truth in sentencing laws where the society, the public, the victims wanted to know that if somebody was supposedly sentenced to prison for a, per, a particular period of time, they wanted to know, well, are they actually going to serve most of that time? And that's what we see in California. So individuals in California after the late 1970s and then through the 1980s, 1990s, and into the 2000s were typically sentenced under a determinate sentencing statute where the sentence that was handed down to them was a much narrower time frame. And the individual would be released, not by a parole board decision, but rather through a mathematical formula. So if they're given a sentence of five years um, in court, then we can figure out when that person is going to be released, not by waiting to hear what a parole board decides, but rather by just looking at the mathematics of it. You could say five years, subtract any time that they had served in jail, subtract any good time that they had earned while they were in prison, um, subtract or add extra time for if they had meritorious credits or if they had bad time accumulation that added back on days. And it's much, a much more of a clear cut um, answer about when that individual is actually going to be released from prison. And that's what California has been doing for the last several decades. Now, under mandatory release, more often than not, individuals are still going to be released to some form of parole supervision after their release. So this sort of, you know, is like the halfway point between discretionary and what we'll talk about next, which is expiration release, where the individual is still going to serve time in prison, but after prison, they're, they're going to be supervised within the community for a period of time under parole, but it takes out the human element, right? It takes out the parole board decision-making um, element of the release process. So that's what we see in California is this mandatory release. Other states will use at various levels and not always for all offenders, but for some offenders, they'll use what is known as expiration release. So expiration release is also usually start with individuals who were sentenced under a determinate sentencing statute. But the key thing about expiration is um, once the individual is released from prison, and it's once again very mathematical, you look at their, their sentence length, you subtract good time, you subtract jail time, you add on any quote unquote bad time or anything else that might fluctuate it, um, but then it's a very clear cut decision about when that person will be released from prison, and the individual is released from prison without any further correctional supervision. So what do I mean by that? Well, the person walks out of prison and they are a free person. They do not have to, they're not on parole. They don't have to re report to anyone like a parole officer or anything on a regular basis. They're just free. They're able to go back to their life as a, as a citizen. And various states use this approach um, at various levels. Um, historically, over the last couple decades, the state that has used it the most is Florida. And there have been years where Florida releases upwards of two thirds of their prison inmates using this expiration release uh, mechanism. And, and you know, so one of the key things that for a lot of researchers is we look at this question of, well, what's better, mandatory or expiration release, right? Um, even though, so they're coming out of prison, we've removed the human element of parole board um, decision-making, 
but should we still watch somebody? Is it safer for society as far as recidivism and public safety and crime? Is it better one way or another for the actual individual who's leaving prison? And so there's a lot of research that looks at sort of what works better, mandatory release versus expiration release. And we'll see that in a lecture that's coming up pretty shortly about um, some data that I actually worked on that sort of examines the effectiveness of mandatory release versus expiration release. And then obviously you can imagine, once you throw back in the argument of using discretionary release, you can sort of imagine a research study that analyzes the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of all three of these approaches. Should there be a human element? Um, should there be a much more of an open-ended sentence? Or should it be very mathematical? Um, it's one thing that when you think about this, and just sort of a, as a quick side note, you know, you think about somebody who was sentenced to prison back in the 1950s or 1960s under an indeterminate sentence. Their family, and even that the individual themselves, they didn't know if they were going to be getting out of prison in two years, four years, six years, 20 years. And there's a lot of, you know, uncertainty that comes with that. Um, but then if you trust in the system and you trust parole boards to make the right system, then people would argue, well, then we're able to promote public safety. We understand that it may take certain people longer to be quote unquote ready to return to society um, under that indeterminate sentencing and discretionary release. There's also more incentive built in for inmates to participate in treatments and programs and counseling and educational things while they're serving their time. So there's, are, there's certain questions there. Whereas we look at sort of the more determinate sentencing and the mandatory release and expiration release approaches, there's questions that go with that. You know, is it better for somebody to know that when they're sentenced on one particular day, on one particular day, they can almost with a calculator figure out exactly the day that they will walk out of prison. Is that better? Is that worse um, for them, for society? And then once they walk out of prison, should they continue to be supervised? So there are a lot of questions raised as we look at various sentencing approaches as well as release mechanisms. And we'll sort of save those for more in-depth discussion down the line. Then not to forget the other two forms of release, there's other forms of release that are also used with you know various levels, but they're definitely not the predominant um, release mechanisms in the United States. So just to quickly um, go over each of them, each of them. Uh, one of them is what is known as other conditional release. And so this is a way where oftentimes individuals may, may be released a little bit early from prison, but they are then sent to a halfway house or a work furlough program, or they're going to finish the rest of their sentence under home confinement, something along those lines. And then oftentimes they then transition on to parole. Um, this is used in different innovative approaches. California used to have a, a program called um, community correctional reentry centers, which allowed individuals in the last few months of their sentence just to sort of prepare them for what it was going to be like to walk out of prison and have to deal with society again. Individuals, if they were eligible and chose to do it, could be could serve the, you know, the last quote unquote three months of their prison sentence at a halfway house that was in a community. So where they would have supervision, it would be kind of like half time jail where they'd have to be, you know, in this facility at night on weekends, but with the right amount of permission, they could go out to look for jobs. They could start to um, participate in programming to get well acquainted or reacquainted with the, the community. So you see different programs that, like that that have worked with various levels of success. Um, there's also something known as emergency release. An emergency le release falls under this other conditional release category too. And especially when we've seen the rising number of inmates in prisons and we talk about prison overcrowding, there's times when, in, or when um, prisons need to decide how to, you know, trim the fat, so to speak. How do we get, if we're, if we're 
overcrowded, how do we get some of these individuals out of here? And that's what California faced um, several times over the last 20 years. And we'll also talk a little bit more about that in a future lecture where under prior to realignment, California was ordered to try to trim their excess state inmates by 25 to 40,000. And so there were different plans and protocols put into place to try to release a couple thousand at this time, a couple thousand later. Um, but also that opens a whole nother set of questions about who should be released. What are sort of the criteria for making those decisions? What are the potential impacts on societies? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a future lecture. Finally, we have what is known as probation release. And probation release is also one of those uh, mechanisms that's used um, with various levels of success, often on much, you know, um, smaller numbers. And these are used sometimes with split sentences or shock incarceration, where somebody may be, you know, um, receive a sentence of felony probation, but they are required to serve a certain period of time behind bars before they're eligible to be released back on, out onto probation. And so it's not really like being going to prison and then being released on parole. Um, it's just where they've split their, their, their quote unquote probation sentence where part of it is served behind bars, part of it is back out in the community. And the same thing with shock incarceration. And finally, for this lecture, we're going to wrap up with the concept of preparing for release. And in our, our next lecture, we start to talk about recidivism and release and the outcomes, especially in California. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But for right now, I'd like you to review the table on page 398 um, if you're using the 12th edition of our course textbook. And especially, I think this may be illuminating to some of us. You would, you know, you think about it, if individuals have been serving even a, only a year in prison, um, but, you know, but whether they're serving one year, three years, 10 years or more in prison, you, at least for me, you might, you would expect that there'd be some sort of pre-release preparation, um, whether that is a couple weeks of classes, whether it's some sort of training, whether it's um, some service providers that help people to figure out a way to, you know, where to live, how to find a job, how to go get the necessary um, identification materials that we often take for granted, where your local, you know, DMV office might be, where your, um, you know, your local um, post office is or, or things of that nature. And so we might expect there to be, you know, pre-release preparation to be a big thing, but I think you'll be surprised. Um, so I want you to take a look at that table and read those pages that sort of speak to it and specifically focus on these three questions. Do states require mandatory pre-release programs? Um, does California have one? Um, and if so, when does California's program take place? And then think about not just California, but think about why it would be important for us to prepare individuals for release from prison. Or is it a waste of time and energy? Um, is it something that is ineffective, that, it, that our budget and our money should be focused elsewhere? So I'll leave it there for today, and then I look forward to seeing you with the next lecture where we get further into what happens once individuals are released back into the community. Take care.